This is Cast of Wonders, the young adult fiction podcast featuring stories of the fantastic. Welcome! I'm your host, Andrew K. Ho. I'm an assistant editor here at Cast of Wonders, as well as a speculative fiction author. My stories appear or are forthcoming from Cast of Wonders, Diabolical Plots, Young Explorer's Adventures Guide, and Highlights for Children, among others. Today's story is the first of our Die November episodes for 2020, From Asteroids to Dust. We did a themed call this year entitled Intelligent Dinosaurs. I guest edited this two-part series and it was a lot of fun. Our stories feature Saurians who are advanced tool users and have engineered spacecraft to wander the stars. They talk and snarl. They love, philosophize, and dream. And they protect what's dear to them with a ferocity we humans could never match. Our first story, From Asteroids to Dust by Priya Chand, is a Cast of Wonders original, written specifically for our Intelligent Dinosaurs-themed call. This is the first of two stories that imagine dinosaurs as more than big beasts that roar a lot. Priya Chan grew up in San Diego and now resides in the vicinity of Chicago, where she studied biology and informatics. When she's not reading, writing, or eating, she enjoys swimming, martial arts, and long walks through museum exhibits. She has previously been published in Clark's World, Nature Futures, and Analog SF, among others. Check out her website, priyachandwrites.wordpress.com, or her Twitter, at PriyachandSciFi. This story is narrated by Tatiana Gray. Tatiana Gray is a critically acclaimed actress of stage, screen, and the audio booth. She has been nominated for dozens of fancy awards, but hasn't won a single damned thing. She went to NYU and lives in Brooklyn, New York. You can follow her online at tatianagray.com. And now, we have a tale to tell. From Asteroids to Dust by Priya Chand Gianti Coropus, Jen for short, piloted her shuttle through the asteroid belt with deft claws. Jen was a Deinonychus, a strong-legged predator whose ancestors subjugated prey across Earth. And now here she was, tail lifting as she whizzed past space rocks. Leftover dust puffed across her viewport, but Jen knew her training facility's asteroid field like all 300 steps of her family's longest dance routine. She kept her sickle claws from scratching the shuttle floor. Some things evolution couldn't turn off, like the hunt or the dance. Her shuttle had been recently resheathed in protective synth rubber. Better not damage it. Jen reached her mining carrier as it sucked a fresh dust cloud into its bottom grill, inhaling the rich metals and spitting the rest back into the void. The carrier resembled a giant fern. Its fronds were individually sealed pods, each with the door the size of a long-extinct brontosaurus. One of these opened, expelling a mecha with enormous arms onto an asteroid. Upon landing, the mecha started pummeling, sending dust plumes up. Jen screeched an altered course. Yes, dinosaurs should practice mining in these giant meccas. She ran a training facility, after all. But nobody mined without her permission. Twisting her shuttle's control bar, Jen landed atop the mecha currently smashing the asteroid, mining for metal dust. Once her shuttle locked into place she dropped down the mecha's access hatch. She was slightly larger than the average raptor, with extra sharp sickle claws, which pierced synth rubber when she landed inside. The trainees were so intent on mining, they didn't hear her cursing. She flapped her arms and screeched. Across the bridge, five raptors in filtration suits turned. Five sets of predatory eyes landed on Jen, but they know who had the brightest feathers here. Jen wasn't a miner, but years of prestigious dance training gave her a good eye and terrifying discipline. 
The pilot, clutching the main control bar, cheeped, tail raised in alarm. Dino Jen! Mulky! Jen hissed. Your group is overdue. Your exam starts soon. Five more minutes to try Velodrian's maneuver? You know my great-great-great-great-aunt? A century ago, these asteroids bombarded Earth. Malky, like most of Jen's trainees, had ancestors among the original meteor-stopping pilots. No surprise there, given the large, healthy raptor clutches that had arisen, thanks to metal dust technology. Malky clearly expected Jen to fold, since raptors and Deinonychus were practically the same species. But species loyalty only went so far. Final exams start in 15 minutes, Jen snapped. No extensions. Anything less than a perfect score means a trip straight home. No second chances. Trainees, you were lucky. Remember, there are so many waiting prospects. Thousands of raptors fight for the chance to space mine. Any of them will gladly take your place. Malky lowered her head. All five raptors activated their control bars, lifting the mecha immediately. See you at base, Jen called, returning to her shuttle. Malky and her fellows had finished their exams and, depending on their results, boarded shuttles either to Earth or new assignments. But they'd tracked dust everywhere. Trainees always did. On Earth, her family's stages were cleaned and repaired after every performance. Jen's training station was just as important to her, but out here, that was impossible. As she vacuumed, she considered purchasing better filtration suits. Reduce the dust, at least. Jen stretched her neck, relaxing her sickle claws. Her whole base was covered in synth rubber. She constantly had to step lightly, lest she slice through and scratch the metal beneath. Yet Earth's orbit was currently taking it away from the asteroid belt, stopping travel for some months. She'd be alone on the station, which, at least, meant less dust. Besides vacuuming, Jen spent this enforced free time undisappointing her family, whose dance troupe was respected on both sides of the Tethys Ocean, by practicing her steps. Not that she'd ever tell them. Your pinions should be at 45, not 46 degree angle, she shuddered. Having a clutch of zealous siblings was bad enough. Jen was doing tail warm-ups when the phone rang. It was Plastrina Jerum, an old Deinonychus friend who chirped greetings before asking, No vid screens yet? I run a training station, Plosi. I only have a tenth of your budget. Plosi would know. She'd gotten Jen this job. You're missing the latest in metal dust technology, Plosi said smugly. My entire facility's getting vid screens. How nice, Jen grunted, slightly breathless. You sound busy, keeping the pack in line. As head of a mining consortium, Plosi would also know Jen wouldn't have trainees right now. Jen's blood quickened. Plosi knew Jen was doing dance warm-ups and was mocking her for it. A larger predator razzing a smaller one. Hilarious, Plosi. Again, what's up? Clanking from Plosi's end. A raptor's screech. Wrong way, idiot! Plosi hissed. Uh, newbies just started. Someone inserted the control bar backwards. All yours, Plosi. Jen meant it. She didn't need her famous last name to intimidate trainees. But Plosi was twice Jen's size, and an ex minor. She terrified her underlings. Face to face, she scared Jen, too. Plosi's voice softened, though the mockery fading. Anyway, I've got new miners. Mm. Wait. Jen heard the door click. Uh, miners, I was saying. She warbled unhappily. You know how the Laurasian Council enforces that quota? Jen crooned sympathetically. The Laurasian Council was raptors plus one Sarah, brought on to prove there wasn't any pro-raptor bias in Earth's largest government. 
That Sarah was constantly rumbling about protecting Cycad swamps from development. You've got Sarah miners? Jen asked. Unlike raptors, Sarahs were four-footed. They piloted with teeth instead of claws. Someone had finally built a control bar that responded to claws and teeth. And now, every mining crew had to hire Ceratopsians. No bias, no exceptions. But those three-horned, plate-headed Sarahs kept demanding better control bars, better suits, better rations. Plosi hissed. They claim my control bars aren't responsive enough, as if mechas are difficult to pilot. They're not, Jen agreed. A mecha had five control bars, but basic mecha piloting only required one pilot using one main control bar to bring in a moderate amount of metal dust. Her trainees usually learned basic piloting within a day. Still, you know how much work we've done to make these mechas Sarah friendly. I don't train Sarahs, Jen reminded Plosi. The Sarah trainer was three days shuttle away in the asteroid belt. But your control bars can handle them, right? Jen rumbled in concession. Yes. Perfect. The nerve insisting my equipment isn't good enough. Craters. Everything I use is up to code. They need extra practice. Five raptors can pilot a mecha through advanced maneuvers for good hauls. But Sarah's are so big. One takes up most of the bridge. I try to send one raptor along, but even so, they take forever to meet dust quotas. Jen extended a leg, restarting her warm-ups. Pelosi, assuming they'll fit inside my mechas, you want me to send your Sarah's on training runs? They're already certified miners, aren't they? I have to update my control bars, Jen. Plosi's voice sounded odd. Just need a few days, and maybe with your, um, dance expertise, Plosi snickered, they'll finally learn proper mecha piloting. I'll send some raptors, too. There's a few slackers. Maybe they're spending too much time with the Sarahs. Tell them it's normal work, not extra training. I'll cover their wages and metal dust commissions. Are we... warm? That question half-hissed between Plosi's teeth, held an implied, you owe me. Jen was curious about the Sarahs, and Plosi had gotten her out here, away from her dance troupe family. We're warm. Send them. There weren't any mornings in the asteroid belt, but Jen's base lights were synchronized to Desert Velo standard time. They'd just warmed to post-dawn when an alert cawed. Groaning, Jen rolled from her nest, brushing herself clean of, what else, synth rubber and dust. Nests on Earth were made with miscellaneous scraps and discarded feathers, but Jen didn't think she'd ever sleep among stiff quills again. She'd dispatched Plosi's crew onto the asteroid for unsupervised practice, or, as Jen told them, normal work. They were already minors, so she'd skipped her usual instruction. The Sarahs were sullen, but oddly determined. They'd insisted on departing two hours early. Plosi was probably right. She'd said they needed more practice. The smallest of Plosi's Sarahs was twice Jen's body length, with thick scaly tails slapping the deck as they waited to board the carrier. Heads the size of Jen's whole body. They'd squeezed themselves into her mechas in the pale pre-dawn lighting. Was that lone Sarah on the Laurasian Council this big? The cawing alert meant someone had returned, seven hours early. Jen headed for the dock, intercepting two raptors helping a triceratops along, their feathers squashed against his scaly bulk. They'd removed their filtration suits, tracking dust everywhere. Dino Jen? One raptor chirped. Bory here? His head flitted to the Sarah. A failed safety check. The other raptor, Tanga, if Jen remembered correctly, chirped in agreement. Jen ground her teeth. Cratering Sarahs. No wonder Plosi was exasperated. 
Please call the emergency star lift when this happens. Bori looked away. Emergency medical services are docked from our pay. Jen's claws crooked in irritation. Considering how lucrative metal dust was, she was sure Plosi would cover the star lift fee. Not that it mattered. Ignoring safety protocol was inexcusable. In space? She enunciated in her best trainer's voice. We call star lifts at the first sign of trouble. Just calling is expensive, Bori rumbled. I'll cover it. Bori's horns lifted. You will? Of course. Your life is worth more than metal dust. Doesn't Plosi... Bori immediately tongued a sensor in his jaw. A star lift operator answered from wall speakers. Starlift services, what's your emergency? A raptor from the pitch of his voice. Nothing serious, Bori said. Bori, you fainted! Tanga shifted from one claw to the other. Are you still sick? The operator asked. No, Bori rumbled. Just need to eat something. He coughed in bass tones that reverberated through Jen's hollow bones. He'd fainted? And the way he'd suddenly complied when Jen mentioned Plosi? Uh, but what did Jen know about Sarah's? Maybe they fainted often to get out of work, like Plosi said. Bori coughed again. I'm a Sarah. A Sarah? The operator hissed. Please don't waste time. We're extremely busy. The line disconnected. Jen sniffed Bori. Senses attuned from the fitness training that came with dance practice. The starlift operator hadn't been concerned, but Bori looked on the verge of collapse. Can we go back? He asked. If you eat something, Jen replied. It's just practice, though. You really want to go back? Bori snorted. Want? Dino Jen, this has nothing to do with want. We need the money. His low voice cracked erratically. So many Syad swamps are being converted into housing. He shook his head, wafting the recycled air. My hatchlings need to eat. Jen's own Dinonychus family, which had expanded rapidly, all those healthy clutches, bought new land wherever it was available. Could those gross, crocodile-infested swamps be important to other dinosaurs? Jen's nostril slits tightened. She'd thought Bori smelled ill, but now she found his dusty scent annoying. What does converting Syad swamps have to do with anything? Ceratopsians eat Syads, Tanga chittered quietly. Without the swamps, they'll starve. Jen's feathers ruffled. She felt hot. Well, I, I didn't mean. Bori's beak clicked. It's fine. We're wasting time. Jen authorized their departure with a trill. Despite her rustling feathers, she barely noticed their shuttle's departing whoosh. Her thoughts roiled, twisting between Plosi's words and Bori's. She warbled at the dust on her nice synth rubber, a perfect imprint of his huge scaly tail. Dinner for the herbivorous Sarahs was Nutri Bars, which even Jen ate while monitoring the Mechas from her office. They were pure energy, designed to sustain Sarahs and keep raptors from wondering just how their fellow miners tasted. Not that anyone would admit to sampling another dinosaur, especially with the Sarahs around. Jen thought the Sarahs would be grateful, but watching them cough over their blocky Nutri Bars soured her. Ceratopsians eat cycads, Tanga had said. Without the swamps, they'll starve. Tanga was a raptor. Why did she care about sarin food? For the other raptors, however, dinner was a proper feast, served on bolted-down tables. On their synth rubber surfaces gleamed large, spotted eggs, 100% pterodactyl DNA. Some of Plosi's raptors took their time, Others tore in, slurping the creamy yolk. Jen licked gooey remnants off her teeth, 
listening to the drifting chatter. The Sarahs ate silently, occasional coughs punctuating the raptor's conversation about life after their two-year mining stints. I'll be recruiting asteroid miners on Earth. My clutch siblings have your number, right? Better more raptors than these Sarahs. Jen was amazed they even needed recruiters. Last she'd heard, the waitlist included some of her own aunts. Plosi kept pressuring her to stay, but asteroid mining wasn't in Jen's blood. She'd saved a tidy sum to buy her own land. But Bori's words echoed troublingly. So many cycad swamps are being converted into housing. A hacking sound pierced the recycled air. It continued, and before Jen knew it, she was pushing past tree trunk Sarah legs, wincing as her pinions bent. What happened? Carnivore and herbivore eyes alike were wide, centered on the collapsing triceratops between them. Bori, from this morning. Dino Jen! Tanga shrieked. He was eating, and then I- I've checked his gullet, no obstructions! Jen arched her neck towards the gasping Sarah. After the fainting spell, he'd gone back out, returned with the rest, and cleaned up before dinner. Although Jen noted dust on his horns. Come on, Bori. She peered into his beak jaws. Tanga was right. Bori was choking on nothing. Legs buckling, tail thrashing. Stay with me, Jen crooned. Do it for your hungry hatchlings. No more bad meccas. No more nurtry bars, I promise. Jen called the starlift. She'd pay. She'd buy an entire cycad swamp if that's what got him better. But Bori was ashen as the asteroids when the starlift took him away. Next morning, the Sarah miners prepped for work as early as before. Not that they had a choice. I'll check on Bori, Jen promised. I'll update you tonight. The Starlift Hospital was one of the largest structures in the asteroid belt. With the high ceiling and bright lighting, Jen felt like she was back on one of her family's stages. Dr. Sufiel Lexi, a tyrannosaur, was waiting against a backdrop of monitors. She would never successfully use a control bar, but those teeny arms were astonishingly deft with the medical robot. Looking at her, Jen wouldn't have guessed it. Her towering body screamed predator. Jen's Deinonychus forebearers were predators, too. But Dr. Lexi's ancestors could have swallowed them whole. Jen ducked around Dr. Lexi's tufted tail, which was the size of Jen's entire body. She tried to keep her own feathers from puffing out. After all, Dr. Lexi and her long, toothy jaw had sworn to do no harm. Jen maneuvered herself closer. What's wrong with Bori? Dr. Lexi indicated a monitor displaying dark and light blobs. Her scraggly crest of head feathers rose, then dropped as she faced Jen. These are Bori's lungs. See those white spots? What are they? Dr. Lexi zoomed in on them. Fibrosis. Half the lobe of his right lung is, as one might say, cratered. I've got several patients like this right now, but none so bad. How bad can it get? Dr. Lexi stretched her heavy jaw towards Jen, who ignored her stiffening tail feathers and focused on the doctor's eye ridge. I'm not sure, Dr. Lexi said. I didn't practice much on Earth. I have to renew my license yearly, and this has never come up. Your trainees are fine, but it's everywhere among the homebound miners. What? Space bacteria? No, nothing like that. I did some biopsies. The Sarah miners are presenting... Dr. Lexi lowered her head even further. So close, Jen could see the green and gold hues in her nearest eye. The individual scales on that oddly featherless skin. They're presenting with asteroid dust embedded in the alveoli of their lungs. Jen stumbled backwards. Dust? How? Sure, the stuff stuck to her feathers, but inside her body? No filtration suit is perfect. Dr. Lexi straightened, 
her voice echoing above Jen. Our pressurized air vents, those probably trap dust too. And the dust is killing us, Jen warbled. I haven't heard about any sick raptors, though. It takes prolonged exposure. You're a trainer. You ride your shuttle out to instruct, then fly back, correct? Mining contracts are two years. But the Sarahs work twice as long, twice as hard. Something about not being able to operate mechas efficiently. Uh, They can't do advanced maneuvers. And half the Sarahs I've treated are malnourished. As if eating Nutribars was any substitute for healthy vegetation. Lexi shook her head. If I examined your lungs, Jen, I'd probably find spots. Nothing symptomatic yet, but in another few years. So, this will happen to everyone? Jen asked. Not just Sarah's? Yes, Dr. Lexi said. Though it's difficult to prove. Radiation regs keeps everyone to that two-year limit. And no one on Earth thinks to look for asteroid dust when miners get sick down there. There are other reasons for lung scans to look like this. Inhaling volcano particles, for instance. Those eruptions constantly spew toxins. We have to report this, Jen said, even if the metal dust is lucrative. Dr. Lexi shrugged. I've sent a report to Earth, but, well... Jen hadn't known enough Sarahs to understand how much things were stacked up against them, but she'd heard enough jokes about bitey, fighty tyrannos. You're a top doctor, Jen insisted, and a scary one, but she didn't say that. Dr. Lexi stared at her, heavy jaws twitching, and Jen finally understood. It wasn't just ceratopsians that had it bad. Dr. Lexi wasn't here for prestige, but because no matter how brilliant she was, no raptor would allow a tyranno this much autonomy on Earth. That lone Sarah on the Laurasian Council was practically a miracle. The preference for raptors had been easy, no, convenient for Jen to overlook. But it hurt all dinosaur kind. Those top scientists I've consulted, Dr. Lexi continued, said my data was no good, not without corroboration. My findings are currently pending review in pneumolosteosis. Knew what's it? Exactly, Dr. Alexi said. She flipped off the monitors. The shadows emphasized the weight of her jaw. Jen sighed. I have influence on Earth. Dr. Alexi cocked her massive head, surprised. My family. Dr. Alexi's jaw dropped, and Jen startled. She looked ready to eat Jen whole. Wait, your full name is Gianti Coropus, isn't it? Like those Coropuses, the dance troupe that performs for the council? Could they pass on my report? Jen looked away. Her family wouldn't care about six Sarahs. And if she was being honest today, that callousness was really why she'd run from them. But Jen's cousin Jargis ran the biggest newspaper in both Florasias. Her family did not talk about Jargis, who'd published an excoriation of their latest show, a faux historical piece featuring some regrettably designed stegosaurus costumes. Jargis's review hadn't held back on the portrayal of herbivore humor. Sometimes Jargis talked about treating non-raptor species better. Jen, who only knew raptors, had always listened politely, but now those words made sense. I can get your work in the Mesozoic Times, Jen said. Dr. Lexi croaked. Just you? Uh, Not your family? The upheaval this information will cause, they'll... Jen's left sickle claw tore a hole in the floor. They'll kill me. She finished. Bori was propped on an enormous pallet, sides swelling with each breath. Jen approached slowly. 
Dr. Lexi had said he needed rest. His color was better. Dinocoropus? Bori rasped. Jen darted over. You know my family? Recognized your name from Plosi. He stared towards an object on the shelf behind Jen. Please. Jen grabbed it, his mouthpiece. Sarah's used these to activate devices designed for clawed two-legged species, like the Starlift hotline. Jen sniffed past its dried saliva, past its coughed-up blood scent, and clicked a button. A crude hologram shot out. My hatchlings, Bori wheezed. I wanted better swampland, cycads for them. Jen watched the young Sarahs, stubby-horned, wide-eyed. They're lovely, Bori. Plosi was a ruthless business raptor. She must have known about the dust problem. This was all a setup. Phase one was getting Jen into mecha training, talking her into applying that dancing discipline and lack of mining experience to churn out clueless but efficient raptor miners. Phase two involved using Jen to get Sarah's and troublesome raptors out of Plosi's way. Bori's small group must have just been the beginning. Plosi probably meant to keep sending them whenever she needed some inconvenient dinosaur removed. Why guard against the dust? The raptors weren't sickening. Yet. And the Sarah's? Plosi's miners had assembled by the carrier dock. Jen stood before them. One trill, and they'd go. Dr. Lexi's blobby scans meant nothing by themselves. Easily dismissed medical babble. But Bori, unable to breathe, on that pallet? That could be any of them. Sarah's or raptors. It could even be Jen herself. All the meccas she'd cleaned? All that ever-present dust? There's a safety issue, Jen said. I'm sorry, but you're grounded. One of them tensed, prepared to argue. Jen shrieked, raising one leg with its wicked sickle claw, synth rubber be damned. That reminded them who was in charge. Jen watched them go and returned to her office. She waited for someone to call Plosi. Sure enough, the phone rang. Jen! What's happening? Plosi actually sounded more concerned than annoyed. Bori's sick. Oh no, Plosi warbled, and not aloud, but audible enough. So? The metal dust is killing Sarah's. Raptors too if they stay long enough. Asteroid dust enters our lungs and causes problems. Big problems. Anyone have proof? Dr. Lexi does. That meddlesome Tyranno. But it takes a long time, right? A little time? A long time? Why did that matter? Longer for raptors, but they leave before the symptoms show. Sarah's work twice the hours. So you're saying we should stop mining? Do you want to tell all those raptors they can't come here because some Sarah's got sick? Sarah's can stay on Earth. It's the council forcing them into space. Jen's tail stiffened. They just need better equipment, better food. That'll cost so much it'll shut us down. And then what happens to all our tech? What happens to you and me? Look, it's not like, don't ruin this, Jen. Who's going to side with one fearmonger over all those waiting trainees? We need the metal dust. You're destroying our way of life over nothing. Jen hissed into her phone. Vid screens. What? Ancient hunting instincts reasserted themselves in Jen's snarl. Instead of better control bars, you bought fit screens. Plosi's answering snarl was, at her size, a snarl that promised ripped throats. Listen, you spoiled little dancer. Jen delivered an ear-splitting screech. Enough was enough. 
Yes, Jen grew up dancing. Yes, Plosi helped her escape her family's constant pressure. And in return, she'd submitted to Plosi's mockery, learned to ignore the prejudice because it was easier. When had she gone from predator to prey? Jen, I, I see you're upset right now, but please don't do anything. Jen disconnected. She rose, stalked onto the balcony overlooking the common area, not caring that her sickle claws sliced through the synth rubber, scratching the metal beneath. Plosi wasn't completely wrong. Jen was ruined. When she returned to Earth, she wouldn't have to worry about her narrow-minded family because every prospective miner would be out for her blood. Raptor packs sniffing her out, running her down. And the Ceratopsians, too, trampling her for their dreams of cycad swamps, for ruining what little chance they had to get ahead. But they'd be alive and able to breathe until better filtration methods were developed. Raptor society would be fine. Even without metal dust, they weren't starving. Jen craned her neck, hearing the miners. Some sounded angry, others urgent, afraid. The would-be recruiter was silent. Those months alone on Jen's station weren't all about vacuuming and tail warm-ups. She'd gone out in the mechas, sold her own metal dust. Jen wasn't just any mecha trainer. Her dance background gave her the dexterity to operate all five control bars on her own. She'd intended to invest in land, but maybe she'd make her getaway instead. My hatchlings, Bori had wheezed. Better swampland. Cycads for them. Jen blinked. She could buy swamps. Swaths of them before the developers came in. That Sarah on the Laurasian Council could probably even advise her as to whom to donate them to. Even if the council member refused to speak to a Coropus, Jen knew one lovely Sarah family she'd give a Cycad swamp to. It was a crazy idea. More thought required. But first things first. Jen returned to her office, uploaded Dr. Lexi's data, and hit send. One hour later, her phone rang. Urgent. Cousin Jargis, editor-in-chief of the Mesozoic Times, wanted to talk. Priya's story originally came to us as a lighthearted comedy, but we asked her to go a bit darker than she usually writes. We love the idea of dinosaurs in space and mining asteroids. The station itself was deliciously Saurian, what with its synth rubber sheath floors and powerful mechas. Yet even in this very dinosaur story, there were familiar elements of human problems, namely the idea of velociraptor dominance over other species. As people in the United States now start to confront systemic inequalities built into our very society, so does Jen come to realize that her reptilian civilization hasn't always been fair. A predator does not run from the truth, and Jen takes action with all the ferocity of her sickle-toed kind to dismantle the convenient lies that have allowed discrimination against Sarah's to have continued for so long. We found Priya's story an irresistible application for our theme of intelligent dinosaurs. Because intelligence isn't just about designing advanced spaceship stations or mechas, but acknowledging difficult truths and making the conscious decision to act. In Jen's case, perhaps one dinosaur's action can spark change. Join us again next time for another Dinovember episode, Velociraptor, guest hosted by Aiden Moher. We love bringing you the best audio fiction week after week, but we can't do it without your support. Your donations pay our authors, our narrators, our servers, and our staff. Please consider supporting us with a monthly donation through either PayPal or Patreon. You can also review us on Apple Podcasts, request us on Spotify, and consider the stories we publish for award consideration. There are lots of ways you can help. Join the discussion on the EA Forum, forum.escapeartist.net, or visit on Twitter at Cast of Wonders. Come say hello! Cast of Wonders is a production of Escape Artists Incorporated and is brought to you by Editor Catherine Inskip Assistant Editors Andrew Cahoe and Carissa Sluss Associate Editors Amy Brennan Alicia Caparasso William Heitminer Sean Proctor Ray O 
Susie Rodriguez, Emma Smales, Art Director, Alexis Goble, Community Manager, Danny Daly, and our audio producer, Jeremy Carter. Our episodes are released under the Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivatives 4.0 International License. That means you can download or listen to the episode on any device you like, but you can't change it or sell it. Our theme music, Appeal to Heavens, is by Alexei Nob and available from Promo DJ or his Facebook page. Thanks for listening. <laughs>